good evening to you. That's the first time I've ever seen my name up in lights. It's also the first time I've ever been up in an airship, and it's also the first outside broadcast of this particular series. We're hovering here in the Goodyear airship over Rome. The ship lives here because the temperature and the climate is equable and it's wet and windy elsewhere. If you saw the Royal Wedding or the World Cup or the Cup Final, you will have had glimpses of the airship. And we're here on an up, up and away day, and our up and away day began at 8 o'clock this morning. Now, do we stand here with this? No, we have to go over and uh, look at the car and sort things out over there in a minute. Why, what, what are they holding on to? This is a nose line to hold the nose of the ship steady into the wind. The, the, the ship can move anywhere, can't it? That, that's not anchored down. No, once it comes off the mast, it's free to move in, uh, in any direction it wants to, wants to move. <laughs> right. Okay. Are they physically holding that down? No, not really. It's, it's the ballast in the back here. These bags of lead, they hold, they hold uh, the ship down on the ground. Right. Two down. How's the trim? 2020. 2020. Let's pick it up. Captain Nicolari, there's a great feeling of actually being a, a pioneer in some ways in this. It's a kind of pioneer airship. There's lots of bits of string hanging down everywhere here. And string hanging down at the front as well. In a lot of ways, the ship is uh, almost frozen in time. The methods we use to ground handle it, and, and other than the new materials we use when we build it, the methods and the procedures are the same as out of the uh, early 1900s and 20s and 30s. Now, is wind the big enemy? Yeah, well, high winds are gusty winds. Or an enemy. It can be either way. If it's a tailwind, it's a friend. Yeah. If it's a headwind, of course, it's uh, not so good because it decreases your ground speed. Have you had problems with wind ever? I mean, in the air? Well, I that's mean, really about the only thing you can say about uh, airships. Uh, sometimes you do run into wind situations. That's why we carry the amount of fuel we do. We're up here on a, on a relatively two-hour flight, but I have 15 hours of fuel on board just in case the wind does come up and we would have to stay up longer. Now, it creates quite a stir, the whole ship, wherever it goes. But you have met all people on mountain tops, truck drivers. Oh, and well, we have made cross countries where, in order to try and keep helium inside the airship, we have flown very low over the top of our crest of mountains. And we've had some truck drivers coming up the other side that suddenly have a surprise when they see a big airship <laughs> cresting the grade in front of them. Now, when it, it has actually to be, it has to be bound. Oh, oh. What is that? What is happening now? That was just our radio. I was just getting a call on the radio. And what is this wheel for here? Because I thought you'd have a thing like that. that this do. wheel is the elevator control for nose up or down, and the rudders, which my feet are pressing, mm. actually steer the ship right or left. Now, the, this ship now is now used as a kind of, almost like a kind of, you're a messenger boy in a way, aren't you? To in a certain ways. degree, yes, we are. Our night sign carries messages, yeah. and uh, we try and do public service work with the airship. And you have a somewhere a typewriter in here. You can actually send a message anyway. Anyway. Yes, we can. And what sort of things do you do over Rome particularly? Well, more, the messages for the, the Italian portion of our stay 
usually relates to safe driving, help keep your home clean, any type of public service message that would be in the, in, in the public interest. But you can send private messages to your wives and tell them what time you'll be home. No, we don't normally do that. I think you do, <laughs> just from time to time, or congratulate them on the birth of a baby. Well, we do that, yes, but we don't really talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, shall we zoom on a bit now? Okay, we'll right. do that. Now, what is a helium head? The helium head is an individual, and they come in two categories, who is enthralled with airships. In the first category, I, I classify as the wild dreamer, and, and they want to see airships that are two and 3,000 feet long, carrying five and 600 people, and going two and 300 miles an hour. The other category of helium head would be a realist, which I like to consider myself, that really feels that airships do have a chance to come back, as, as mainly as freight haulers. They have the potential for hauling great amounts of weight in terms of freight and doing it as inexpensively as you could carry it on a truck. It's all from slung underneath, would it be? Pretty much, or some of the rigid designs are also very viable where they actually carry it internally. What is the biggest airship you have driven? Uh, this one right here, right. barely so 200 feet long. Right. So we're in the realist category at the moment. Right. right. You've been to Britain with this ship. Yes, we have. What have you covered? Well, last year we did the FA Cup final. Uh, we did the Pope's visit. We took the ship all the way to Inverness to cover some scientific expedition that was actually trying to seek some proof of the uh, existence of the Loch Ness Monster. And what did you see there? Well, we really didn't see, I can't tell you we saw the monster. We did some interesting things with sonar and coordinating with the sonar on the ground. And uh, if there were something there, I would say that uh, we would have had a pretty good chance of spotting it. Do you think the monster saw you at all? It's really hard to say. Uh, this, the theory that I accept about the so-called monster is that it is a prehistoric mammal of some kind. It, just happens to be able to live in that particular habitat and is kind of reclusive, and I think it possibly could exist. You see, the, the interesting thing about you covering the Pope's visit to Britain is that uh, no doubt when he looks out of his window in the Vatican of an evening, he may see you passing around Rome, mm -hmm. and that when he'd gone to Britain, probably to get away from you, there you were swizzling around in the, in That's the air true. again. Yeah, we're always there. Even when we take vacations, if we happen to be downtown on a day off, there's the ship. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. <laughs> something. Yes, it? I mean, sure, yeah, it should. But when you stand inside it, 
When you stand inside it, it's enormous. It's like being inside a sort of, um, I don't know, it's almost like a, an unborn world in there, in a sense. What's happened in the Colosseum? Nasty things. Very. Uh, very nasty things. Uh, games from sadistic emperors in which uh, one out of two gladiators would have to die. Uh, games for sadistic emperors in which animals ate Christians, that sort of thing. No, no, very nasty things. But you get that feeling of, of something rather evil. They put a sort of crucifix up in the middle of it to try and assuage that, but it doesn't. Now, the biggest, brightest, shining thing there on the left, uh, what is that? That's that white, is, yeah. if you look at it, it looks like a huge typewriter. You see? So it does, yeah. yeah. It's a white, uh, it's called the typewriter by some of us. It was the monument that the Italians built to mark their national unity and their taking of Rome as the capital. And they put it right there, as you see, right at the very center of ancient Rome. It's got the Capitol Hill on one side, and then you back down to the Forum, which was the, the, the center of life in ancient Rome. The Capitol was, of course, the governmental center and is in fact the square and, well, the hill which has given its name and its type of architecture to dozens of governmental buildings throughout the world and throughout the centuries. Why is it called Victor Emmanuel? It's called Victor Emmanuel because, uh, this is the typewriter, it's called Victor Emmanuel, yeah. because the first king of Italy was called Victor Emmanuel. He was in fact the Grand Duke of Savoy and King of Sardinia. Uh, he was the one, he was the, the uh, person whom, whom Italy was unified around, shall we say. Now there's the dome of St. Peter's, which is instantly recognizable, and all those gardens behind it are the, what, the Vatican. That's the, the Vatican city. Gardens, Which yes. is a city. Yes, but that's not only just a city, that's a whole state. Uh, those gardens you see are one third of the entire state in area, and it's the smallest state in the world. It's one tenth the size of Monte Carlo. It's very small, but it has all the attributes of a state. I mean, the Pope is uh, head of state, among other things. Uh, he runs, he's got, he can produce coins, stamps. He could even, he's even got a flag. He could have a merchant fleet if he wanted to. Up to now, he doesn't want to, but he has, uh, it is a, a, a completely independent state. Is that a radio, that's a radio station? That's a radio station. They have radio. Um, they have uh, shops which are um, free of all Italian taxes. So if you buy something in there, it's much cheaper than Italy. They have all the attributes of a state. And what do the Romans themselves who live around it think of the, the fact that they have a separate state? There? Well, it's pretty clearly, I mean, it's, there are difficulties. I mean, you, you, you've got one great city with two capitals in it. And they are two capitals of two, you can say, quite different civilizations. I mean, there's the great Roman classical civilization, which as you pass over, you'll see the, there's the Colosseum as, as impressive as St. Peter's. But they are two great civilizations. One, of course, the, uh, the Christian civilization, because this is the, the center and has been, since practically the beginning of Christianity, has been the biggest base of Christianity in the whole world. Uh, there, they are, there they both are. And in modern times, you've got the capital of Italy, which is comparatively young. The Italians had to take Rome off the Pope in 1870 to have it as their capital. And they've left this small enclave, um, which is the Pope's city. That's it for me and all my friends in the airship, Trevor Francis, Peter Nichols, and all our friends of Goodyear. We'll be back with you in London next Tuesday night. Meanwhile, from Rome, bye-bye, good night.